Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore. Community Bookstore will be celebrating 50 years in business this fall, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you for spending the evening with us. I'm thrilled today to welcome Paul Oster for the release of Burning Boy, his new biography of Stephen Crane out now from Henry Holt and Company in conversation with Charles Bernstein. Now to some housekeeping, um, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button also on the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book, which is of course very important if you haven't already. One caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. Um, and we've also scheduled a whole host of fall programming for you. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is next Tuesday, November 2nd, we're thrilled to welcome Yotam Odalengi and Noor Murad for their new cookbook, Odalengi Test Kitchen, Shelf Love, in conversation with Bon Appetit, Editor-in-Chief Don Davis. Uh, tickets for that program come with a copy of the book and they're available on our website now. Now, about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Paul Oster is the best-selling author of 4321, Sunset Park, Invisible, The Book of Illusions, and the New York Trilogy, among many other works. In 2006, he was awarded the Prince of Asturias Prize for Literature. Among his other honors are the Prix Medici Etranger for Leviathan, the Independent, the Independent Spirit Award for the Screenplay of Smoke, and the Premio Napoli for Sunset Park. In 2012, he was the first recipient of the New York City Literary Honors in the category of fiction. He has also been a finalist for the International Impact Dublin Literary Award for the Book of Illusions, the Penn Faulkner Award for the Music of Chance, the Edgar Award for City of Glass, and the Man Booker Prize for 4321. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and a Commandeur de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. His work has been translated into more than 40 languages. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Charles Bernstein is the winner of the 2019 Bollingen Prize for Near Slash Miss, University of Chicago Press 2018, and for Lifetime Achievement in American Poetry. He is the author of Topsy Turvy, also out from Chicago Press, April 2021, and Pitch of Poetry from 2016. He is Regan Professor Emeritus of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Pennsylvania and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So now without any further ado, Paul Oster, Charles Bernstein, thank you so much for joining us. I'll hand it off to you. Well, it's great to be here and in your home with the Siri and uh, Susan uh, at the other end of the table. The, the peanut gallery and uh in in your living room here in is it park slope <laughs> or park slope it's a section a very charming section of brooklyn new york notable for its brown brownstones small yes. independent family houses and you've lived here for quite a long time yes i have and and in fact I'm only a few blocks away from the bookstore that is hosting this event. Right, community bookstore. It is our oh, community. Right. Yeah. And we live just in, in a way, it's another world and an adjacent neighborhood, not so far from here. You live on the other side of the Gowanus Canal. Right. And then there's... Walking distance. Yeah. So for one thing, Paul, congratulations. This is the actual publication date of, yes. of the book. Yes, it's the birthday of the book. And actually, Stephen Crane's birthday is coming on November 1st. And it will be the 150th anniversary of his birth. Now, so, am I right that this book is for sale through the community bookstore? That's the idea, yeah, as far as I know. And how do you do that online now? You click things and put your credit card in, and then you get the book within a few days. Uh, I, I Presumably, I, I really I'm don't know how sure to do this. that it could be bought yeah. directly from well, the community bookstore. Since the uh, the peanut gallery earlier was asking, why why did you write this book? That's as it. A, as hey, a potential question. question. <laughs> and and I, I was going to say, I wrote it to make a lot of money. Uh -huh. So I'm hoping, How's that going I'm hoping, it? well, I, I don't think um, very well yet because the book is only out today. Well, we shall see um, in any case. Maybe um, it's too many pages to make a lot of money. Maybe a 300 no, page book could make money, but a, a thousand page book. I, I intended I originally to write a book of about 150 or 200 pages, but 
I got carried away. Well, I want to hear about that carried away, but I have to ask you because some people here will not know anything about the book or even about the subject of the book. If you want to sort of give a some opening pitch well, to uh, what, I, I thought, what, what this is all about. Rather than put it in my uh, own words, I'm going to put it in my own words in the book. Uh, just, just This is how the book launches. Um, born on the Day of the Dead and dead five months before his 29th birthday, Stephen Crane lived for five months and five days into the 20th century undone by tuberculosis before he had a chance to drive an automobile or see an airplane, to watch a film projected on a large screen or listen to a radio, a figure from the horse and buggy world who missed out on the future that was awaiting his peers, not just the construction of those miraculous machines and inventions, but the horrors of the age as well, including the destruction of tens of millions of lives in two world wars. His contemporaries were Henri Matisse, 22 months older than he was, Vladimir Lenin, 17 months older, Marcel Proust, four months older, and such American writers as W.E.B. Du Bois, Theodore Dreiser, Willa Cather, Gertrude Stein, Sherwood Anderson, and Robert Frost, all of whom carried on well into the new century. But Crane's work, which shunned the traditions of nearly everything that had come before him, was so radical for its time that he can be regarded now as the first American modernist, the man most responsible for changing the way we see the world through the lens of the written wor word. And I'm gonna jump ahead. Uh, 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 the next page covers his family and his background. His father was a Methodist minister and he was the youngest of 14 children. Um, so uh, after one disaffected and aborted year as a college student, a single semester at Lafayette, followed by another semester at Syracuse, where he played on the baseball team and registered for just one course, Crane headed back south to the twin destinations of Asbury Park and New York City, determined to make his way as a professional writer. He was not yet 20 years old. On September 28th, just blocks away from where Crane would, be, would soon be living in Manhattan, the unread and all but forgotten Herman Melville died. On November 10th, ten, thousands of miles to the east in Marseille, France, Arthur Rimbaud died at the age of 37. 27 days after that, Crane's 64-year-old mother died of cancer. The newly orphaned budding writer had only eight and a half more years to live himself. But in that short time, he produced one masterpiece of a novel, The Red Badge of Courage, two boldly imagined and exquisite novellas, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets and the Monster, close to three dozen stories of unimpeachable brilliance, among them, The Open Boat and The Blue Hotel, two, collec two collections of some of the strangest, most savage poems of the 19th century, The Black Riders and War is Kind, and more than 200 pieces of journalism, many of them so good that they stand on equal footing with his literary work. A burning boy of rare precociousness, he was blocked from entering the fullness of adulthood. He is America's answer to Keats and Shelley, <laughs> to Schubert and Mozart. And if he continues to live on as they do, it is because his work has never grown old. 120 years after his death, Stephen Crane continues to burn. I'm going to jump ahead a bit and read um, uh, the last paragraph of the next little section, which ends with the poem that Charles wanted me to read. And I think it's a very good way to get into our conversation. Um, I, I say about this book, I come to it not as a specialist or a scholar, but as an old writer in awe of a young writer's genius. Having spent the past two years poring over every one of Crane's works, having read through every one of his published letters, having snatched up every piece of biographical information I could put my hands on, I find myself just as fascinated by Crane's frantic, contradictory life as by the work he left us. It was a weird and singular life, full of impulsive risks and often pulverizing lack of money and a pig-headed, intractable devotion to his calling as a writer, 
which flung him from one unlikely and perilous situation to the next. A controversial article written at 20 that disrupted the course of the 1892 presidential campaign, a public battle with the New York Police Department that effectively exiled him from the city in 1896, a shipwreck off the coast of Florida that led to his near drowning in 1897, a common law marriage to the proprietress of Jacksonville's most elegant body house, the Hotel de Dream, work as a correspondent during the Spanish-American War in Cuba, where he repeatedly stood in the line of enemy fire, and then his final years in England, where Joseph Conrad was his closest friend and Henry James wept over his early death. And this writer, who is best known as a chronicler of war, embraced many other subjects as well, handling them all with immense skill and originality, from stories about young children and struggling bohemian artists, to firsthand accounts of New York opium dens, conditions in a Pennsylvania coal mine, and a devastating drought in Nebraska. And much like Edgar Allan Poe, often mistakenly identified as nothing more than our dark browed purveyor of horror and mystery, when in fact he was a master humorist as well, the somber pessimistic crane could be hilariously funny when he chose to be. And underneath the mountain of his prose, or perhaps on top of it, there are his poems, which few people in or out of the academy have ever known quite what to do with. Poems so far from the traditional norms of 19th century verse making, <clears throat> including the norm breaking deviations of Whitman and Dickinson, that they scarcely seem to count as poetry at all. And yet they stay in the mind more persistently than most other American poems I can think of. As for example, this one, which has continued to haunt me ever since I first read it more than five decades ago. In the desert, I saw a creature, naked, bestial, who, squatting upon the ground, held his heart in his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good, friend? It is bitter, bitter, he answered, but I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. So let me come back to the, the that, that poem I asked you to read in, in a moment. OK, when you said sure, more sure. about this, yeah. th this work. I mean, in a way, it's the only thing you're going to read of Cranes, but it's so condensed. It has so much of the of the macabre and symbolic and uh, 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 expressionist in it that, that it, it could stand for the other work of his in this discussion. But first, I want to ask you about the genre of your work. Now, I know this has come up before, your problem with genre. I mean, I, I hope you're, you know, you've thought about this. You don't really like stick to what people think of as the standard genres. But this book in particular could be a number of different genres. For example, is it a biography? Is it a nonfiction novel? Is it an essay? Is it literary theory? Is it American history of the late 19th century? Is it an expanded rather than condensed books? You remember Reader's Digest condensed books? <laughs> yes. This is like the opposite. Yes. This is, yeah, Hart Crane lived just a few years and this is expanded. Stephen, and, Stephen. And, and, and then also it's kind of a, in respect to what you're saying about a modernist it's, it, it, of, of Crane, it's in a way, it's a work of collage or palimpsest or montage. So which, which is it? Charles, I think it's all of those things. Um, um, I, I felt that I couldn't really tackle Crane without exploring his work in great detail. That, that's my, that was my prime uh, impulse. But at the same time, I wanted to tell the story of his life because I think it's connected to the kind of work that he did. And each one uh, feeds into the other. Uh, and since I was talking about things that are not current, I mean, no one talks about the Spanish-American War these days. It seems so far in the past, but it actually isn't. And in fact, the Spanish-American War was the beginning of the American century. Um, you know, America's great uh, assertion of power on the world stage. Um, 
And so I wanted to explore all of these things. Um, I, when I finished writing the manuscript, I was curious to see how it all fell out. And I counted up pages concerning his work and counted up pages concerning his life and the times. And they pretty much are 50-50. Um, which seemed about right, I thought. Um, I, just a pure study of his writing wouldn't have been as interesting to me. And I certainly don't, as I say in the beginning of the book, I don't approach it as a scholar. I'm, I'm reading Crane raw. I'm, I'm trying to uh, present him to the reader, uh, who is someone I assume has never read a word that Stephen Crane wrote, or very little. And therefore, since Crane was such a, a, a writer of such varied talents, who employed different methods of composition, depending on the kind of work he was trying to write, that I wanted to give a, a, a rich sampling of all this variety uh, in, his, in his prose, and also you know, to talk about the, the poetry, but also the journalism, some of which is exceedingly good, and also inside, some of these articles are buried sentences and ideas that I think really help to explain some of the deeper meanings of Crane's most important fiction. So everything is connected. You know, in that way that you're talking about the work, it reminds you a little bit of two classics of uh, American poets writing about uh, 19th century uh, precursors, Charles Olson's Call Me Ishmael and Melville and Susan House, my Emily Dickinson. In a way, this is your, my uh, Stephen Crane, although it's very, very different than those. Yeah, those, those are two of my favorite books, I have to say. Yeah. Um, and Paul Metcalf, too. Maybe. I agree. Genoa, uh, which is yeah. about Melville also, who was his great grandfather, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in any case. Uh, you're, you're not yes. related to Stephen. No, no, but we were born in Newark, New Jersey, Newark, New at, di Jersey. at different that's times. How, is yes. that near Ashbury Park? I know Ashbury Park. I thought I was going to ask you about Bruce Springsteen. but It's not Ashbury it. Park. That's the Asbury. poet. Asbury. Asbury Park. Asbury. Yeah. Not Asbury. John Ashbury I'm, Park. I'm yes. from the Upper West Side. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's where there's, yeah, yeah. there's, the, there's the ocean there, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to go there when I was a kid, um, uh, especially in high school. I drive down there. It took about an hour, hour and 15 minutes down the Garden State Parkway. And it was a... Um, a fun place for teenagers to go. Uh, amusement park, roller coaster, boardwalk, the ocean. It was a, a fabulous place. But I didn't know that um, Asbury Park is named after the first Methodist bishop, yeah, well, a lot of Methodist Francis Strength. Asbury. And it was a Methodist stronghold. And it was developed by Methodists. Yes. So how about the connections kind of follows on my genre question of this work to your other books. Now, it goes back to the fact that you've done a number of unexpected books. And I think it's fair to say that this book would, is unexpected for you to do at this point in your, you know, in the, in the set of books that you do something that's about a single writer that has this strong historical and biographical uh, impulse. Uh, and it is to some degree, well, it is nonfiction. Course, yes, yes. In that way. You know, your last book was also quite a, quite an epic book, epic, you know, pound set of uh, epic poem as a poem, including history. This is an epic novel. 4321 has some connection in terms of the scale, and even the time frame is a little bit after. How does, how does it relate to your other works? Do you see well, this as if you were to put this in line with several of your other I, books? I don't know what to tell you. I never would have imagined myself writing such a book. Um, and it came about after I finished 4321, which was in 2016. It was published the following year. Uh, I was really, really, really exhausted. And I, I knew I was going to have to take some time off, that I, I had to put my pen down and, and just clear my head. And, and not try to write anything for a while. And it's really the first holiday I ever took uh, uh, from, from writing of any length. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do during this period was to catch up and read books that I'd always meant to read and hadn't. And I was plowing through a number of wonderful things. Uh, series favorite novel, Middlemarch, for example, which had resisted me for decades. and. I finally 
got into it and read the whole thing and admired it greatly. Um, returning to Virginia Woolf, after years of thinking I didn't like her much because I had read the wrong books when I was 18 or 19. And, and finally, and finally, um, too much noise from the peanut gallery there. Uh, and finally, understanding that uh, To the Lighthouse is one of the most beautiful, shattering novels I've ever read. We agree. We all agree. To the they're, 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 they can't, you know, this is a directional microphone. I know. They're so doing. They're, 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 they're not being heard, but we Well, hear, I think they are heard, but, but they are great spirited raising, raising their right, thumbs. Um, the okay, there's so thumbs up for that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> among, among the things I came across on my bookshelf was the Viking portable edition of Stephen Crane. I had had for many, many years, but I hadn't read Crane. Well, I read him in high school and uh, I read a bit in, in my yeah, undergraduate days. We had that assigned, the red yes. badge of courage, 10th grade, wrong sign. Me too, 10th grade, Columbia High School uh, in New Jersey. And um, um, I opened it up and I came across a novella that I didn't know anything about and in fact had never heard of. Uh, entitled The Monster. It's a work of 60 pages or so, uh, written in 1897. I was so thrown back by this work. I, I found it so powerful, so original, so astoundingly surprising, because it's a book about, among other things, race, but really head on. Uh, the, the central character is a Black man. Um, in a small northern town. And um, I was so impressed by this work, which I think is uh, uh, one of the greatest American works of the, of the period, that I was inspired to go on reading more Crane. And I, I plowed through everything in that 500 page selection of his work and, and felt um, inspired and um, elated enough to want to go on. And I, I got hold of the Library of America edition next, which has about 1300 pages of Crane's work. I read every single thing and I, I, I began to understand how great this writer was and how neglected he has been for, for quite a while now, which pushed me into, because I was just pursuing you know, my impulse here, um, the collected works of Stephen Crane. 10 volumes, over 3,000 pages of published writing. And of course, all done in a very short period of time. He was life. 28 he, when yeah. he died and he, and he published all this work. And I, um, I, I, at the same time, I started reading about his life. And, and as I explained, you know, just reading everything, letters and biographies and uh, uh, accounts of him by, written by other people. And I realized that um, I wanted to write a small book of, <laughs> of an appreciation of Crane yeah. to just share my enthusiasm for this late in life discovery of mine. Well, one thing led to another and the little book became a, a quite a hefty book, um, but no regrets. And I, I did it with a lot of enthusiasm, but at the same time, I kept saying to myself, this is an answer to your question. Why am I doing it? What the <laughs> hell am I doing writing this book? And the only answer I could come up with was, now, if you remember, in 4321, there are four boys, the same boy named Ferguson. Yes. And there are variations on his life. And I decided, I, this is magical thinking, that Crane was Ferguson Five. Uh -huh. oh. and, and, and that is the answer to my question. That's right? the answer. He was Ferguson yeah. Five. And here's the thing. I've never written a biography before, but I've certainly written a about a lot of characters in novels. Right. And trying to understand Crane in all his contradictoriness, which is true of nearly everybody, but his, his contradictions were extreme uh, at times. Um, trying to, you know, fathom and put together this, this complex personality, I understood that I had to go through the same spiritual uh, journey to understand it as I do with a character in one right. of my novels. Well, it certainly does read like a, a, a Paul Auster novel anyway. I know some people tell me who've read it, they said it just, it, right. they, they it settle in and it, it feels as if they're reading a novel well, when in fact it's novel, not. Well, I yeah. mean, but it, it, 
it feels like a novel. Yeah, one of by, my by one of you. my books. That, yes. Or of course you have many works that are not novels too. Yes. And it fits into those too. So th this is what I want to follow up on that. And it has to do with fourth trend, which is the obsessed storytelling. And I think that's what makes the length of it. In this book, it, uh, readers will be noticed right away. You retell uh, uh, almost compulsively in, entire tales of, 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 of Crane. You yeah. quote a great deal, but in other cases, it's like a a, a, a sea captain telling a story. <laughs> One yarn on after the, the other. Yeah. The Brooklyn Bridge. Yes. And then you're repeating it, even though you have the text, you're, you're, re, you're retelling it. So you have quotes, the retelling, but this constant, I would say it's almost like a nested set of stories, inside stories, inside stories. And this is partly, I think, what it also it's a little bit like a tra translation and recontextualization. Um, you do this in some of your works, like, for example, I think of the best years of our lives, where you retell the story of the best oh, years in, of in, our in, lives. Oh, in Sunset in Park. In Sunset Park. Yes. Not so far from Sunset Park. No, no. Saying. Uh, and it's interesting, and you do, you know, it's one of the kind of things that is, you know, characteristic of you that you have things like that, that are, and that's why I think it's a collage or montage, but yes. here you do it at a, at a much greater scale than you've ever done. Yes. You almost feel like an abandon to retell these stories and then add on the biographical stuff, the journalistic stuff, the story of the Spanish-American War, which of course, not, not telling crane stories, but making your own stories. And in fact, well, even in this conversation, you're continuing to, you know, yarn. Spin, spin tales. Spin. So what, yeah. what and spin is a good, yeah. it's a good term for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you leave me speechless. So I don't my, know what to well, say. <laughs> well, my question is, what got you interested in particularly this quality of, of retelling? I, I, because I, I, I imagine myself sitting down with uh, a young person, an intelligent young person, because no one is going to read this book who isn't interested in books. I, I don't have to uh, uh, convince uh, non-readers uh, of Crane's importance. They're, they're not going to be interested. But I think, but I, I think non-readers will not be turning to this. No, no, exactly. So so I, I'm, I'm assuming a certain level of literacy from my reader, but at the same time, but it's a, very, lack, it's a, a lack of knowledge yeah. about, about Crane. And I don't feel as if I were a teacher so much as just a, uh, a friend uh, telling another friend there's this great writer and I want, I want to talk to you about him and, um, and, and therefore going into it in certain depth to, to explain why I think it's so good and what's, what's so good about this work. Um, I mean, I guess, though I want to go on, the, the, what, what interests the book is incredibly engrossing and it, it pulls you in through this technique, but it has to do with a long standing uh, engagement that you have with what storytelling is that is different than a lot of stories are that have discrete beginning, middle, and ending. Right, right. It's, it's, it's stories that are almost like uh, in Conrad in a vortex that go up and down. And of course, Crane is very much a writer of the vortex of catastrophe. Yes. You get involved with it. Well, he his, sort of can't believe what's his, going his, on. His, his, his greatest works are all works about extreme situations. And uh, by extreme, I mean people in danger, physical danger. Uh, that would include many stories about war, but also stories about impoverished people, people living in the yeah. slums. Uh, and I think if that's why the work really hasn't aged because it is talking about such fundamental human issues yeah. that uh, they don't change. And therefore, the, the, the work is still deeply relevant, it seems to me. And when you figure out, too, after reading, you know, these quotes from the stories and novels that I've put in the book, and you see the, how vivid his prose is, how, how um, tactile it is, and how, um, how his, his visual perceptions, particularly visual, are more acute than, than just about any writer I can think of, combined with this um, tremendous ability to um, transform these difficult uh, perceptions uh, into vivid language. Um, a tremendous gift in him for simile and metaphor. Um, and, and so 
uh, it's, it's, and it's all driven by a, almost a kind of animism. I mean, you know, inanimate things are alive. Uh, and, 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 you know, the trees in the forest are alive and the stones are alive. And the, and, and I, the, the way he can, he, can, he can talk about light, you know, and what light is doing. So people have talked about him as a, a painterly writer or even a cinematic writer as if he's anticipating film, because Crane did not write these long rolling 19th century novels. He wrote very spare short works that were mostly fragmented. And the cuts, the jumps from one scene to another are very much like film editing. Um, and I, I think it was uh, very unusual for that period for anyone to do this kind of thing. And what Crane does is he strips out everything that is not utterly essential to his purpose. Uh, so in his most famous book, The Red Badge of Courage, it is, uh, of course, a novel set in war, but he never me mentions the name of that war. He never mentions the cause of that war. We, we know it is a civil war, but he never mentions the word slavery. The name Abraham Lincoln never comes up. We don't hear the name of a single general from either side. What it is, is the inner story of a teenage uh, volunteer in the Union Army and his first encounter with battle. And it's a book about fear. And, and um, it's an extraordinary um, combination of the inner and the outer. Um, but then, it, it, but you just, you don't know any of the peripheral details that you would find out in, say, we were talking earlier, a novel by Tolstoy would give you. You don't get that in Crane. And as I say, it's, I think in describing Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, which was his first novella, um, you can't curl up on a sofa with a Crane novel the way you can with Tolstoy or Balzac or Dickens. I said, you have to read Crane sitting bolt upright in your chair. And I, and I think this is, this well, is he's, how you have to pay attention. Also yeah. with Maggie, yeah. he's dealing with a subject that was unacceptable. So this is another thing that I, I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, his, the, the view of him as being immoral or taking up, not having a moral point of view, which after all Tolstoy does just yes. to some extent because he, 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 he's also in a way the first that we say it in the book embedded journalist because he's, he's not only writing these fictions, he's also a journalist. He's also in the middle of actual battles. Yes. He's not just writing, he moves between the, the journalism, but the journalism itself is, is uh, distorted, strange. It's and not strange. This is, I think, uh, you know, people talk about his origins as a reporter. He was never a reporter. Uh, well, Crane, I say jer jer no, I, no I know, right. I know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, but you know, a lot of his early work, these wonderful sketches, they were called, that was the yeah. literary term for it, about New York City, and he, oh. he goes out and he describes things that he sees uh, in the city, uh, uh, and it employs this journalism, it's like the new journalism of the 60s, in that um, it breaks with the conventions of traditional reportage. Uh, these people like Tom Wolfe and Norman, they didn't yeah. make this up. Crane, Crane was well, doing it back and, in the and, 1890s. And, and this is to me an echo in your own book. You also invent a different way to write about him as a kind of new, new kind of biography. Perhaps, I don't know. I, I haven't really read uh, uh, a literary biography that goes so deeply into the work of the writer. Well, also, I mean, for, for one thing, that Crane himself was a very extreme, disturbed person. So that's why he seems like a character in a novel. And he writes about things that were unacceptable by bourgeois standards. Yes. Now, did he get a lot of, this is a softball, but, a softball question, did he get a lot of negative reaction to his weird well, uh, style and his uh, extremely subjective point of view? and his lack of traditional framing and ornamentation, and also for his seemingly writing about prostitutes in a non-judgmental way, a way that- Let me put it this way. He got, he got both. He got both uh, a tremendous praise after a while and, 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 and constant attacks from other quarters, uh, which is, I think, um, normal for any, any artist who is as original as Crane is, 
uh, it's not going to appeal to everybody. And it is going to offend many sensibilities for various reasons, either aesthetic or, as you say, moral. But I think, you know, you mentioned that word. And I think, in fact, Crane was not a disturbed person, as you, as you say. He, was, he lived deeply and intensely. Um, and I think his, his work evolves. There is a, a change as, as time goes on. And you see him becoming um, uh, what almost a, a, a figure who prefigures uh, existentialism. And, I, and, and he's, you know, it's a world without gods. And what are men going to do? I mean, how can we make sense of our lives? I, I definitely think the open boat is like, it, it's, it's proto-existentialism. But and in a way, one of the arguments you're making <clears throat> is that the 1890s with Crane in America is to take the place of what 1914 is in terms of aspects of aestheticism. But you say he's not disturbed. You call the book Burning uh, Boy. I mean, he obviously had from a conventional point of view now or then very extreme things happening to him. He didn't have yes. money, he was starving, he was sick. I mean, if I don't know what, when you say he wasn't disturbed, I don't think he was mentally ill. No. I think that he was subjected to very uh, uh, dis disturbing well, he, circumstances. He had, a, he, had a, he had a rough life and he also took enormous risks. He took great risks. And he was also yeah. a gambler. You know, he loved yeah. poker above all things. And uh, I think he loved not knowing. And that he loved the whole, uh, contemplating threw, yeah. the whole business of chance. And what, what is, right. what is this he, about? He threw himself into circumstances that were, you know, out, 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 out of balance in terms of uh, personal safety. Well, certainly in Cuba. Uh, but I think he knew. He, he, he left England and, and went to Cuba to report on the war. He needed money, but but still, there are other ways to make money than than go into a even with his malaria infested uh, his, jungles. His girl, from the lovers that you talk yeah. about, and so on. All of that seems like a a character in a novel somehow. In such in such a short, his relation with his brother, all the stuff that you go into. But I, I think it's interesting to say it's not disturbing. But <laughs> well, I, you, you I, read and you I, feel I, great empathy for no, him but and I, the pathos of it. But you certainly feel, boy, this this guy is is. Well, he, he's living intensely. <laughs> living intensely. Okay, is let's it? let's leave it. Let's that. let's yes. But, and that, now, this is the most important point. But I know that elsewhere in New York City, there's a debate between the next mayor and somebody who's running against him. We mm -hmm. can't even remember who he is. So I'm thinking about New York City, and it's fascinating that Teddy Roosevelt, famous to the younger people for the person who had the statue in front of the. Museum of Natural History, yeah. but um, which has been taken down. Teddy Roosevelt also was, what was he the, what's the high office in America? The president. Yes, right. he was. President he was, he of was the United States. The youngest, but, youngest in history. But he was also the New York City police commissioner. He was. Now, what, and he was, went after Stephen he, Crane. Well, this is, he persecuted this, Stephen but, Crane. But this is, this, well, it started out, Roosevelt was a great fan of Crane's work and they were friends. Um, and Crane happened to witness a, um, fall, he was doing a, a series of articles for Hearst on the Tenderloin, which was the naughty neighborhood of New York. And he witnessed a uh, false arrest on trumped up charges of a prostitute by a plainclothes policeman. And uh, since he had seen it and knew the woman was innocent, he defended her in court. Um, this caused great controversy and anger among the police in New York. They turned against Crane. They raided his apartment when he wasn't there. They, uh, and then when the, when, when the uh, woman sued the, the policeman for false arrest, Crane had agreed to testify. And they um, smeared him on, when he was on the stand. And they accused him of all kinds of things he had never done running an opium den, living off uh, the money of prostitutes, so he was a pimp. And uh, they made life so difficult for him that he had to get out of town and he left. And that's when he tried to get to Cuba for the first time, went to Florida, waiting for the boat, waiting for the boat. And when he finally got on the boat, it sank. And seven out of the 20 people on board were drowned. And Crane wound up in a little 10-foot dinghy right, with, with, the, yeah. with three other men, one of them the captain, an oiler, and the cook. 
and they couldn't get ashore. The, the sea was so tumultuous. Uh, they were near Daytona Beach, now what we call Daytona in Florida. And they were out on the open water for 30 hours plus. And I think that was a turning point in Crane's understanding about the world. The human solidarity that he experienced with those three other men changed him. And I think his work took on new tonalities after that, culminating, I think, in The Blue Hotel, which was written a, a year or so later, uh, in which he, he says this remarkable thing, every sin is the result of a collaboration, uh, which is a very, very deep comment. And um, I think is a way into understanding sort of the, the moral framework uh, in which Crane was operating as a writer. So we, we just have a little bit of, of time left to, to keep within the, the parameters that were, were given really? to us. So, but yeah. I, I want to just close with a couple of questions. One, one of which has to do with what you said in the beginning about the radicalness of his work. Do you, do you see his work in terms of aestheticism? Now, of course, he was involved with the in East Aurora, the arts and crafts movement, although that was an odd circumstance, but still it directly tied into arts and crafts movement in England and aestheticism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, uh, he could be seen as innovative, even avant-garde. Do you see him with it in, in that way in the 1890s? I, I think, yes, or I think he was, a, he, was, he was attracted helpful. to all these things. He knew about them. Um, uh, but I think he was... Um, most of all, he wanted to shake things up. And, and so, I, and I think he did it in his own way. He really wasn't ever part of a, a movement. Well, I don't and mean he, in terms yeah. of a movement in yeah. that sense. I mean yeah. in terms of revolutionizing I, writing it. it I, not, I, not only for America, but within a European context. But I think it was, it was, he was trying to be as honest as he could about how he saw the world and how he experienced the world. And, and you know, the consequences be damned. He had to tell the truth. And he, he said, you know, this is a man's honesty is the only thing he has. And I try as best I can to be as honest I can, in spite of my weak mental machinery, he says. He was very modest, Crane. He never bragged about anything. And, um, and he, he was stubborn and he worked, he worked so hard while pursuing all kinds of other things at the same time. And I think he just, he exhausted himself. And then in Cuba, he came down with tropical fever, probably malaria, combined with weak lungs. Um, he, he just was never the same. And he got back to England afterwards and he died 16 months later and uh, working, working right up to the last minute. Now, if you will, go back to the poem that you read of his, it's such a short poem. Yeah. And his poems, which we're not talking about so much, are really extraordinary also for the design of the Black Riders with the capital letters, yes, yes. small thing on a dark. Certainly those are could be thought of as the first, you know, they, they certainly relate to symbolism, expression, things you almost couldn't imagine this person do, doing if, if you think about those movements outs, right, outside right, of the U.S. Right. What, what 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 do you think about that poem? That poem, that poem is, I mean, what, I've, what, 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 I've, I've read it. Why is it his heart? I, I've why read is it. it I, I really think that it's 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 psychologically so profound and astonishing that a 22 year old could have written this. And I, I really think it's about how people come to love their own misery. And and they can't they they they're inseparable from from their misery and they eat themselves alive. Uh, and it's bitter, as as the mm -hmm. as the man says, it's bitter, but I like it. But you cause it that, is bitter. That poem so many times, and, and you have no idea. It just yeah. always is selling you something else. I know, I know, I know. And I think it's it's helpful to read it in the context of the other poems in the collection, um, which are all set in a kind of fabular world. Uh, and it's interesting too that the style of Crane's poems is so spare. Whereas some of his prose is really quite lush, yeah. uh, but he stripped everything down in the poems. And he, he, he thought that he was giving the truest expression of his thinking in his poetry. So maybe this is a good place to stop because it's the, exactly the time oh, the well, outer limit that we well, were asked. Okay. And uh, we move now to 
uh, questions. Any questions that uh, those uh, and they tuning in are, might, are, might have? And if not, I have another set of things that we can yeah. take up. So it, are there any questions? Um, well, yes. First of all, thank you so much for this conversation, both of you. This has been a pleasure for, for me and I think for everyone at home, judging from the questions in the Q&A. Thank um, you. Those Good. of you at home who are watching, you can still continue to submit your questions if you have them. Um, I'd like to start with this one from Lars Leonard Drachman asks, uh, I feel Stephen Crane influenced writers such as Joseph Heller, Norman Mailer, and Hemingway. Do you agree with this assessment? And what other authors do you think uh, were inspired by Stephen Crane? Well, Hemingway for sure. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's documented. Um, and curiously, Crane in New, in New York, he knew Hemingway's mother when she was trying to be an opera singer. And, and, and when, when she couldn't pursue that career because of a, a childhood illness she had had with her eyes and the theater lights were too strong for her, she went back and married Dr. Hemingway in Oak Park, Illinois. And she used to read Hemingway Crane's stories and probably told him stories about how she had known that you know, young genius back in the day. Uh, another writer who was uh, crazy for Crane was Sherwood Anderson. Um, another one was H.L. Mencken, uh, uh, very, very, very fun. And and Conrad, too. Um, well, Conrad, we, were, we didn't even get into that, but no. maybe I could expand that and take this opportunity to ask you the question about the European context. So how do you see him within the, the context of his contemporaries in, in Europe? So Conrad was his friend, Henry James, he knew. There are some aspects that are like Zola, perhaps. Maybe there's a little Flaubert. How does he fit uh, within that Tolstoy? How do you see him fitting well, with that spectrum? Tolstoy was a writer that Crane loved. I, I think he he declared at one point when he was quite young that he's my favorite novelist. Um, but his work doesn't resemble Tolstoy's at all. Um, no, except that in some way, the, 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 the sense that you could do that much and the historical sweep, even though stylistically not like that, but the ambition yeah. maybe. The ambition, perhaps, yes. Um, 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 uh, it's also interesting to note that three different um, uh, poems, lines from three different poems by Crane, surfaced as titles of novels in post-war America, post-World War II. There's a, a, a novel called In a Lonely Place, which was made by into movie, a very movie. good movie Great by movie. Nicholas Ray and yeah. Humphrey Fantastic Bogart, movie, yeah. by Dorothy Hughes, yeah. uh, an excellent no novelist. Yeah. And, um, and then there was a, a novel by Ross MacDonald, another crime writer, a very good one, Find a Victim. Mm -hmm. And more recently, in, uh, in the 90s, Joyce Carol, Carol Oates wrote a novel which refers back to the poem we read at the beginning, mm -hmm. because right. it that's is bitter right. yeah. and because it is my heart. That is the title of one of her novels. So that's pretty interesting that that even Crane's poetry should have influenced um, the writing of fiction in, in America. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, <laughs> another question from an anonymous attendee. Anonymous. Uh, I don't know if I want an anonymous question. A poison pen letter, perhaps. Uh, They're all very it. kind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the aspect of Crane and the impact of chance on his life. Um, besides Ferguson, are there any other characters or situations that you've written about that you feel relate directly to Crane and his experience around chance? Um, after writing about Crane, did it bring any new aspects or connections for you in those characters that you have written about? So I guess chance, that's a Chance, I, you must have thought a little bit about chance. I have thought about chance. chance. Yeah, yeah, I've thought about it. I've thought about it. But um, 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 I'm just trying to think um, uh, how, how best to, to answer this. Um, I think I understood Crane uh, after a while, or I feel I did, um, because I've had experiences somewhat similar to him in that when I was a young beginning writer, I struggled a lot and I, I was rejected a, a great deal. Uh, all, all my early writing was difficult to publish um, and it was deeply frustrating, but I persisted and, um, and in spite of rejections. I mean, it's, it's surprising to think now the New York trilogy 
which is probably the book of mine people know best. Um, when, when I finished the first volume and tried to publish it, it was rejected by 17 New York publishers. I remember that, actually. You, you, you well, at the time. Charles and, and I, I know the person no, who didn't reject you. Yeah, too. who didn't reject me, I know. Douglas Messerly. Douglas Messerly, who ran a small, very excellent press right. in Los Angeles. So the New York Trilogy was published in California. Yeah. How's that for, for irony? And... Um, uh, and so I think that stubbornness of Cranes, I had it as well. And so there was that link. And I think that character trait was something that helped me into understanding him because I, I understand these impulses in myself as well. But one, one thing which relates, maybe not to chance per se, but certainly to aspects of that in your other work that the questioner may be thinking about too is when you read this book, it goes on, you just such unexpected things happen that even if you here yeah. you're dealing with something i mean i i knew hard i knew stephen crane you know fairly well i had yeah. read all all the work but i knew you know i knew i knew his life story to some degree to some degree you know, maybe a, a 10 page yes. summary of it. yes but i mean so but the story is known and yet every page is sort it's, of shocking in it, your it's book. crazy how is it's it possible crazy. because it's all true no. you know and and, and the it's, detail. It's, it's, it's like you know, the red notebook uh, of mine, where, you know, I'm just telling what really happened. And it's so strange. And so the conclusion is that um, life is filled with the un with unexpected events. And we I think we should uh, not be surprised by this anymore. But just take it as part of what I call the mechanics of reality. And in and in uh, Crane, those those unexpected things that happen aren't given an over an overriding moral or historical no, meaning. No, no. They actually have like an open boat and existential. They actually you come smack up against this this thing. Maybe it's reality, but in his case, it, maybe it's the imaginary too. It, it's hard to know where the yeah. one stops and the other. Well, stops. I think Crane was obsessed with this question about the utter indifference of nature to mankind. Right, with that and, poem, by the way, yes, that whole book is yes. all about. And, you know. and uh, that it's not, it's not that nature is cruel. It's not that nature is kind. It's just that nature is utterly indifferent no. to us. And, um, and um, so, again, how do you deal with this? Uh, well, he compares at one point in one story, I think it's in the open boat, he, he compares men to mice nibbling at the sacred cheese of life. <laughs> and then in, in the Blue Hotel, yeah. he, he describes people as lice, you know, clinging yeah. to this orb circulating through the cosmos, clinging, so he's, clinging he's to it. He's a little bit like our American Nietzsche in some way. In some well, way. There, there are some furious uh, passages in his work, uh, that one from the Blue Hotel being one of them. Um, but, okay, we might be lice, we might be nothing, you know, <laughs> but still among ourselves, among human beings, what human beings do to one another matters, if not to the cosmos and nature, at least to human beings and how we behave with one another matters. So this is, this is the position I think he, he, he came to after in the beginning, really standing back and just looking. And then I think he was trying to later on make sense of these things for himself. Anyway, any more questions? Yes, several. Um, here's a quick one. Uh, with so many siblings, was he close to any of them? Uh, yes, um, he, he, it's interesting. He was so by far the youngest. His next oldest sibling was eight years older than, than he was. Um, and so there were 14 children born, nine survived, and then two more died during Crane's early years, a beloved sister and uh, a, a brother who was um, uh, a few years older than he was. And he was very close to uh, Edmund, uh, who was, I think, 14 years older than he was. They were very, very close. And um, in fact, Edmund at one point had... Uh, twin boys and one of them was named Stephen you know after after his little brother and then there was this uh, a, an older brother William who was um, the wealthiest and most successful of all the crane um, siblings 
who he was 19, 18 or 19 years older than Crane. And he served as a kind of pseudo father because Crane's father died when he was eight years old. He didn't really have a father. And William was a very um, complicated, not very nice person who did some nasty things to his brother under the guise of being kind. Um, and towards the end of the book, I, I, I described their relationship a bit like the fable, you know, the ant and the grasshopper, um, because Crane certainly was the grasshopper hopping around and, and the ant brother who's working diligently to make money, who, who published one book in his life called, I mean, it, it breaks your heart. This is the brother of Stephen Crane. His one book is called A Scientific Currency. <laughs> it's really depressing and and William um, really pushed out Crane's widow from consideration of right. any yeah. money in the estate after oh. after Crane died he he was um, he was an uh, not not a nice man and it was tough but Edmund was beloved and and it was Crane's favorite and then another brother Townley who kind of cracked up uh, and it became a terrible alcoholic. But Townley was a very gifted newsman, and he owned a um, news agency in Asbury Park, where the family had li lived. And um, Crane started working for him as a teenager and writing about, you know, the summer seasons in Asbury Park. And that's how he learned to write, because he had an older brother who gave him a job. And um, kind of went back and forth with yeah, that brother yeah, over the years. That's too. right. And not many, not many budding writers have older brothers twice their age who happen to own news agencies. Yeah. So, so it was a lucky break for Crane. Now, yeah. I know we're coming to the end of our time, but shall we more questions or? Yeah, I think we have time for, for maybe one more. Um, okay. okay. Maybe one very short one after that. Um, why do you think Stephen Crane has become so much less well, well known, so much less read despite um, his ageless qualities? Is it a lack of interest in the subjects or something to do with the politics of his day, perhaps how he fell out of favor with the mainstream in his own lifetime? No, I think it's simply this, that uh, whereas, as Charles mentioned in high school, we all read The Red Badge of Courage. Um, and it was required reading, I think, all across the United States. Everybody read that book. Everybody knew it. And, and the, interested, the interested students you know, went on to read more Crane. Um, if you're not exposed to Crane early, um, you, you're, you're missing out on an opportunity. And um, so, so young people are not being exposed to him. And uh, it's later on in, you know, in college courses on American literature, of course, Crane is taught. But these are already people who are starting to specialize. And what I'm interested in are just people who like to read and they're not gonna become writers or scholars or professors, just readers. Um, and so without that early introductory uh, experience of Crane, I think um, young people have not found him. And the whole reason I wrote this book, uh, I, my great motive was just to simply get people reading him again. Yeah, was, related to this was also an international context. Uh, as the book is published here today, and congratulations again on the publication in the United States, there are m multiple translations already out. You just get well, a sense of that scale because I imagine Crane is not necessarily that well known outside the US. No, either. he's not at all. Uh, no, uh, but but it, the book is out in, um, well, it's out in England and it's out in Canada. Uh, all, that, all the separate publishers. That's English, English translations in those? English translations, yes. The no, they change your know, color as O-U-R. No, no, it's the same book in England, but then it's, but it's also out now already in Spanish and in French. And Spanish means not just Spain, but Latin America as well. And um, so uh, I'm, I, I'm told the reviews have been terrific in both places. I haven't seen them, but good. And if I can get foreigners to read Crane too, mm -hmm. I'm more than thrilled at that as well. So Great. Well, to that note, one last very brief question. Uh, for those of us readers who have not read Crane before, where do you recommend we start? With Red Badge of Courage, with that novella you started with, with some of his poetry perhaps, well, I mean, you could you could plunge in anywhere, really. But I would say 
there are six works of Crane's. I, I thought about this. And if anyone wants to get a, a real taste of what he could do, um, well, yes, read the poems. That would be the seventh thing. Um, but but the, uh, among the prose works, uh, I would say, yes, read Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, and The Red Badge of Courage, The Monster, uh, The Open Boat, and The Blue Hotel. Uh, and there's a very humorous short short story that's wonderful called The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky. Now, I, I have to disagree with you because I would say if you haven't read any Hart Crane, you should read this The is Burning... Stephen. Stephen. Sorry, Stephen. 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 I'm, sorry, you know, I'm <laughs> suffering from my, uh, my typical... Uh, dyspraxia but i want to get into that that connection too if you haven't read any stephen crane you should start with the burning boy which i think is available from the community bookstore <laughs> what a salesman charles yeah right. definitely <laughs> definitely the best first thing to read yeah. for sure Great. you heard it from me so you're making my job very easy those of you at home uh charles is right Burning Boy is available from Community Bookstore now on our website in the store. Um, please do consider getting a copy and please join me in thanking Paul Oster and Charles Bernstein. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank Paul, you. Congratulations on the book. And those of you at home, we hope you'll join us at another virtual event at Community Bookstore very soon. I just wanted to say last word, if anyone's interested in buying the Brooklyn Bridge, talk to Charles. Yeah, you know, <laughs> he's, 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 by the way, a, very, very good deal on it. Yes. But just until the end of um, October. Okay. You heard it here. Okay. Thank you very much for having us. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>